I welcome everyone here to this webinar this afternoon. My name is Ori Van, the resource specialist for Natal Farm David Consulting Limited. Um, Natal Farm David um, organized this uh, webinar, and um, Natal Farm David is the leading pro provider of solutions and expertise across a number of industries, including human and manpower development, operations and strategy, research and business reengineering hearing amongst others. I was trying to read up the profile of Mrs. Adam Aleku, who is the president of IFMA. She is going to be one of the uh, guest speakers to lead this discussion we are having today. We also have Mr. Mr. Adebayo is an astute administrator, a resourceful and solution-driven individual with strong flair for excellence. He graduated with, in banking and finance from the Quara State Polytechnic and had masters in corporate governance from now Leeds Pickett University UK. She's had over 20 years of experience in banking. He's also here with us and will be taking one of the topics that we'll be dealing with today. We have Mr. Aino Olumide. Mr. Aino Olumide is, um, is, uh, is the Managing Director of Green Facilities Limited. He will also be um, speaking today on the topical issues we have. We also have Mr. Stephen Jagun. Mr. Stephen Jagun is a fellow in facilities management, is a fellow in um, Nigerian Institute of Surveyors and, and, and Valuers. He's a board member at Estes Surveyor and Valuers Registration Board of Nigeria. And he's also the principal partner of Jagun Associates. I welcome you today for those who are joining in and um, I want to introduce my CEO, CEO of NASA Farm David Cons. He is Mr. Kenneth Odushola Stevenson. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let's, uh, let's first of all, as we Uh, however, I'm very to be able to look at the industry that is currently globally has an over 1.9 trillion in terms of investment. And so uh, we will get to talk about how we'll proceed in a few minutes, but let's have Mrs. Van uh, to continue with the, the, with the speaker. Okay, um, we we'll want to have, we'd like to have Mrs. Abimbala Olushe Wademelokun online to take us through what the ongoing challenges are in the facilities management and sourcing during this COVID-19. Um, good afternoon again, everyone. I want to appreciate and um, acknowledge the organizers of this event. I want to thank you for the opportunity given to me to talk. Um, I'm happy I'm the first to talk <laughs> with all the um, resource on this platform at this time. Mr. Lumide, I know, uh, Mr. Jago, and uh, my vice president in IFMA facilities. If, I, if they were to talk before me, I don't know what is a, a, a little girl a small girl like me will be saying, so I'm so glad I'm speaking first. I also want to salute every facility um, manager on this platform. I'm happy to belong to this profession in a period like this when the world is shut down. Um, we happen to be the first responder. We, have, we happen to be part of those who are available to keep the world running. So I salute everyone. Thank you again for having me. One of the very uh, important uh, points I would like to make, the challenges that we've been facing in the industry during this period, is communication. 
it suddenly came upon us. We were not prepared. Um, you find out that most of the time, even when you're when you have your emergency preparedness in place, most of the time they do not really work according to all the testing and the practices you've had. So this COVID um, pandemic came suddenly upon us and we were not really as prepared. So communication is one of the challenges. We find out that because um, we were locked down, the internet was very busy. Communication amongst ourselves, among our clients, with our um, subcontractors was a bit of a challenge at this time. Um, being able to meet and discuss, have meetings with our clients, with our uh, subcontractors, like our, I said, with our team members was a bit of a challenge. But I want to say that um, quickly, in a way, we were able to get around it with a few apps that um, we were able to lay our hands upon. A lot of uh, industry quickly started having meetings online through Zoom and other apps that were available. So to an extent, we were able to overcome that challenge. I know my colleague will be talking to a very large extent on technology, so I'm sure he will address that. Uh, going forward, I believe that a lot of other ideas will be coming up, like intranets within offices, within organizations, uh, hotlines, um, softwares will be developed to reach out to specific individuals, website may be set up among organizations. So I think um, on the long run, we'll be able to mitigate against this uh, challenge. Another uh, challenge that we have, it's um, contingency plan. Like I said, um, it's not been business as usual. A lot of things have changed. And so uh, during this period, we realized that some of the emergency plans that we have in place couldn't accommodate this kind of pandemic. So um, during the period, we were able also to um, build up some plans around it. Uh, part of it was working from home. And I know that um, with the events of things on the long run, a lot of organizations may also resolve to this solution. It's temporary, but I believe it's also um, most likely be the way forward. And then um, also, as we move on, I know that a lot of our uh, contingency plans will be uh, reviewed to accommodate long and short term pandemic. Also, staff well being was an issue. We realized that we couldn't um, quickly get some of our staff to clients' location. Um, there were issues of um, quarantine, there were issues of self isolation, there were issues of government policy in terms of lockdown. And so, reaching our staff to um, do the normal things they would have done and the clients was also a bit of a challenge at this time. Um, again, like I said, going forward, um, um, organizations, FM companies may have to review their policies in terms of staff well-being. During this period, um, a lot of uh, staff had had to work from home. So these are some of the things that um, we may have to work on um, the staff well-being for some peculiar people like uh, maybe pregnant women people who are vulnerable are uh, things that definitely will be reviewed after this pandemic next on my point is um, we realized that some of our contracts for a lot of us uh, in the industry our contracts did not really cover this kind of pandemic alongside with that is our insurance and I know that um, that was a bit of a problem. This was not caused by, this um, pandemic was not caused by anybody. Um, clients have had to look at, you know, their finances and have to say, hey, look, you were not available during this period, so we're not going to pay you. So going forward, it's been a challenge. And I know that going forward, uh, there are things we will have to look at to make sure that our contract accommodate things like this. Um, we'll have to talk to our lawyers to see how they can um, inculcate some of these things into our contracts so that if possible, we may have to stop um, the contracts for the time being, or we may have to 
reissue another contract at a time like this. Also, chain supply was an issue. Um, with the national and international lockdown on borders, we find out that some of our materials we couldn't get, uh, we couldn't get them, we couldn't get to procure them. Um, a lot of us um, had issues, of course, with transportation. Uh, the planes are not flying. The 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 um, road transportations were not working. So in a way, we were sort of stranded. We realized uh, that cash was a, was an issue. A lot of some of our contractors, especially the lower class ones, they don't do internet banking. So to get money across was also a big issue during this period. Cash flow was a problem. Um, internet access was also a problem. You want to transfer. Sometimes the internet is so clogged and uh, you're not able to transfer money. So these are some of the challenges that um, have arisen during this period. I know that going forward, um, the relationship management certainly will have to improve. Um, I'm looking at a situation where uh, FM and their um, organizations that we're providing services to will have to sit down together and review some of the terms and conditions of the services. We'll have to be very open-minded. We'll have to be very objective in these days and um, time when some organizations have actually improvised um, other ways of providing services. Um, we have all kinds of um, robot cleaners, robots providing services, for instance, in hospitality businesses. So I'm sure these are some of the things that will be reviewed. Our business development and networking will have to also be looked into, especially um, when you have events um, like um, uh, major events, for instance, in IFMA, like World Workplace, I know a number of events have been cancelled. Some have been postponed, even on the personal um, grounds. Uh, things like weddings have been cancelled because of the regulations about shutting down of public places, um, bans on large gatherings. I'm sure it has affected a lot of things around this time. So these are the things I believe that... Um, to an extent, we've been able to accommodate. Yes, some of these events took place on a, with smaller numbers, but I believe that uh, going forward, these are issues that we will have to look into and be more prepared in future. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am, for these um, um, challenges that you have outlined. And I'm sure that the organization that IFMA will take up um, some of these issues up and they come up with reasonable policies regarding some of the things you have um, said about. And having said that, I want to call on Mr. Olumidaino. You'll be taking us on um, how the sector has been managing and maintaining safe place and functional during this pandemic. We are welcome, Mr. Eno. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to be, uh, to be here today. Well, we, uh, none of us expected this uh, realities that we are facing today and uh, it was a surprise even like uh, the president said even our business continuity planning did not capture this kind of uh, pandemic even uh, world uh, uh, renowned organizations were really not prepared but someone expected it so it's a reality and we are need so we just have to find a way to meander through and ensure that the services that we are providing to our clients do not suffer. Majorly, we, we, we've been really hit a, a, a blow due to the pandemic. Due to, um, for, uh, as regards to some economic realities, cash flow has dwindled down. Uh, some people have lost their jobs 
because contracts were reviewed and uh, that, that was really clear. Clients could not come to the office yeah. because they are not a special service uh, provider or salary has to be slashed and some salary, some people has to be fired or some people are told stay at home. <coughs> Once the bank is we will call you to come and start your work. And some clients also as a resorted to considering remote working. So the need, need for space has really shrinked. There's little demand for space now. A lot of people are taking their offices back to their home. People are working from home right now. Not just remote working. They've taken their office. They've left that commercial space and gone back to their home, use the space within their home as their office space. Because of the realities, they've lost a lot of uh, contra, uh, customers, a lot, a lot of contra and uh, issues like that. So we were not ready, to be sincere. We were not ready. Even the best of the best were not ready. But going forward, we, we have to face the reality and find a way to resolve uh, some of the issues and continuously serve our clients. We cannot tell our clients that, oh, this is an act of God, therefore we cannot provide you the, the, the relevant services that we are signed on. So the first thing that was actually done was to educate, was to educate the client and uh, uh, our team, people that are serving. And uh, I, I really, looking at it from a positive angle, this pandemic, because uh, we've been trying to communicate some of these things to our wonderful clients about the use of some solutions, technologies and stuff that could help them reduce costs. It was not really sinking. Maybe we're not communicating very well, but I really want to thank God or thank uh, this reality that we are in because it made everybody to be educated spontaneously. People started looking forward, thinking about, even asking questions. What can I do? How can I ensure that my business doesn't go down? I cannot monitor uh, my business remotely. How can I ensure that the value proposition that I've promised our clients does not dwindle? So it helped. So there was a, it, it was a, we were able to scale through from ground zero to like the seventh level, which really helped. So a lot of inclusions of technologies, people start considering technologies. Working from home, that has been a major issue before. Clients will tell you, how do I manage how my, uh, my team? How do I appraise them? How do I monitor them? How do I enforce to ensure that they do their jobs? But now you've seen that it's easy. We have a lot of solutions in terms of technology. Processes, organizational processes can also be reviewed to capture all those things. I was joking with um, a friend of mine who is an HR. I said, if I were you, you'd be the first to quickly walk up to your MD and tell him that you can be working for him before the guy considers to fire you. And it was like a joke until she did that and the guy said, I was even considering mm -hmm. that you need to be working from home. You don't need to be coming to the office. Therefore, you need to slash your salary or something like that. I said that those are realities because space is money and maintenance of that space is also very expensive. So if you reduce the demand, the use of that space at this particular time, it could be a cost saving opportunity or strategy for the organization. So like I said, the first level is educating the clients, knowing this is where we are, where do we need to go forward and also reducing the uh, physical uh, impact of people within the workspace. For example, uh, one of the clients that we serve, a very big client, we had to section our team into about three to four batches. So people will work for two weeks. After that week, they'll come break. The other one will work for two weeks, go and break. And we try, we try to assess the job and redistribute the job again to ensure that those essential services that is required by the client to also operate are not affected. So with that, it helped everybody. And the level of uh, safety or the knowledge in terms of understanding of how this COVID-19 works, the virus, the, the causes, and how you can avoid it was also increased at every level. Through SMS, you know, Zoom meetings, Engaging your team, 
regularly. Those that are not feeling fine, we encourage them to visit the hospital so that they check and we are sure that they are A-OK without having any uh, 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 COVID-19 traits. So with that, it helps us to move further to also reassess the, the situation. For example, you have a place where you provide uh, energy management solutions. You run their generator, you supply them diesel and stuff like that. The supply chain uh, um, factor is very, very key. Having a very good relationship with your suppliers and also having funds available to pay them. So clients that are owing or clients that uh, don't pay on time prior to the pandemic need to also review that their process that they need to make funds available in order for them to get the expected services. So supply chain was, is very, very key. Like the president has said, and it boils down to that relationship, timely supply of those uh, consumables. And uh, sometimes we're unlucky because some of these consumables are shipped from abroad. So it also gave birth to opportunities that we also need to be looking local, thinking local. For example, uh, in my company, we are able to deduce uh, some solutions locally. And we're spending a lot of money in ad currencies, shipping some equipment, so it's little two items, tools that we need to work. Rather, we can, you know, <laughs> look and work of them. Good enough, we're even able to get some uh, undergraduates to solve this problem for us. They've been working on their final year project, and it was something that was related to some of the elements and tools that we use to serve our clients. So the supply chain is very, very key, and I see this uh, pandemic as a major, major opportunity for us to go back to basis, especially in Africa, and start doing things ourselves, start considering uh, technology espionage, learning about the technology and replicating the same here. It's not impossible. By the time we start, we'll be able to make do with something wonderful, something reasonable uh, at the end of the day. So go, going, going forward, in, in, in terms of uh, remote monitoring, you know, in uh, this age and time of uh, fa facilities management, the inclusion of te technology is no more luxury. It's no more a kind of uh, marketing tool that you share with your client because you want them to engage you. You want to have uh, them uh, in put, 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 you, want, you want to put them in your portfolio. But there are new tools that can help avoid calls that can help bring more visibility into your processes, into your operations, and the client also will appreciate it. So these are some of the things that FMs are engaging right now. Clients sit down in their homes, in their respective locations, and they see real-time solutions, real-time uh, operational activities that is happening in probably in their estates, their building, their farm, their hospitals, or in any built, built environment. So that has been the um, actions, that, that has been the reactions of facilities management, you know, from basic physics, Newton thought of motion said to every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. So the action of COVID-19 came, the facilities managers responded well. Unfortunately, the Lagos State government, the federal government itself did not consider us as essential service providers. But we are able to challenge that. We are able to prove to uh, our numerous clients that without us, there will be failure in service delivery. Without us, productivity will reduce. Without us, they are going to lose a whole lot of amount of uh, revenue. So that's all those uh, factors, all those actions really help to stem the wave, to really stem the, uh, the negative impacts which we couldn't control totally because we were not prepared. And finally, uh, going forward as FMs, we've gone back to the basis to review our business continuity plan and also forecast possible uh, uh, pandemics in future. Now this is COVID-19, we could have another pandemic in future. How do we respond to it? What are the possibilities that there will be regeneration of diseases or breakout of uh, uh, other virus in future. So I, 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 I think as FMs carrying out research, uh, collaborating, and also integrating with professional institutions like IFMA, 
where they do a lot of research to get more insight, to get more information that will enable us as FMs to properly manage the built environment. Thank you. While we wait for her to continue this conversation, let me thank the first two speakers. Uh, for making it very clear as to the kind of, you know, some of the challenges we've been facing since uh, COVID-19. And hopefully this will all be over very soon. Uh, whether it is over in the next one month or two months, but what, the, what this thing has presented to us is a new normal, it's a new way of doing things. And uh, the speaker had just said, Mr. I know I just said that uh, client has to look at how they schedule their payments. If they were not paying before, how would you want me to provide services, especially at this time? And then the president has also spoken in the same in the same line that yes, the challenges are here is with us, and there's a need for us to continue to manage it in the, the, the process as it were, and also see the reason why the facility management that is over 1.15 trillion globally uh, will also thrive and survive this particular pandemic because as, as it were, uh, it's actually a responsibility for this facility management managers so to speak especially those in the janitorial services area of it because what is important they are thinking they are talking about safety safety you come into your office it must be clean we have been told that we must wipe off the, the table as many times as possible and so there are so many opportunities and the challenges that this has brought into the facility management uh, portfolio so i want to believe that uh, somehow uh, we are all ready and uh, we are ready to take the challenges up and move forward along with this. So uh, hopefully uh, when Madam comes in, I would like to uh, invite Mr. Shegun Adebayo. Mr. Shegun Adebayo is our next speaker. I always going to talk about technology. Technology, because right now as we are holding this particular conference, people are all over the world and listening. And which means that uh, uh, facility management will now be facility management without borders, which means technology must play a key role in ensuring this works out as quickly as possible. So, Mr. Adebayo, we'd like to hear you. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. Once again, thank you so much for this privilege to speak. Um, and today I'll be speaking from the angle of um, uh, IFMA, where I happen to be the vice president. Uh, our initiatives and the effort we've made since the beginning of this uh, pandemic. Um, I also have to align myself with the president and also the last speaker, Convener uh, Lumi in the areas of challenges as highlighted by both, both of them. But more instructively, um, speaking from the angle of technology um, in this current environment, let me emphasize that technology is one of the key core competence of uh, IFMA, IFMA has 11 core competencies, and technology is one of, one of the core competencies that um, it is used to integrate and drive conducive environment and activities in the built environment. Let me also emphasize that um, this current situation will likely be with us for a longer time than we imagine. And then um, the need for us to, I mean, express a positive reaction towards defeating this situation cannot be over emphasized. Um, of course, the agility of uh, technology, like the, the president of, um, or the MD of uh, organizers said, is that um, what we're currently doing is also a reflection of positive technology to have a conversation around how we can collectively fight this pandemic and also get us ready for safety mobility as the case may be. And then as an association of um, credible and professionals, it's important to say that even our agility as, I, as IFMA Nigerian chapter is a reflection in our response to the current uh, situation. Um, I mean, for the first time in 40 years of um, existence of IFMA Global, if my Nigerian chapter, we held our World FMD using technology on the Zoom uh, this year, uh, precisely May 13. As also an association, we've also been engaging ourselves as a member of uh, IFMA 
using technology. Uh, we've had a knowledge sharing session. We've also had, um, as, as a council member, uh, Friday conversations among ourselves on the direction if man want to want to follow at this point in time. So the agility of our reaction is also, like I said, reflective of our innovative responses. One of the key things if man have been doing, and um, also emphasizing on the point of uh, Mr. Lumidia, you know, about either federal or state government not also acknowledging the critical importance of uh, facility managers in the fight of this uh, COVID is that if I have commenced an engagement with some specific stakeholders to begin to align the technology to drive facility management in view of the current realities with their organization-wide um, technology strategy. This is very key because um, you can't create a conducive environment without um, understanding the value of what can give you a limitless access to converse, to discuss, and to also execute the creation of a conducive uh, built environment. What we are also doing from the angle of uh, IFPA is the need for us to also engage some public um, institutions and other essential institutions in the area of trying to advise and contribute to their means of reducing their operational expenditure in this time used through the use of um, technology that is artificial intelligence driven, especially on remote management of power generation, distribution, or supply, either main or autonomy power. So those are the initiatives as an institution of our bring to form to try to actualize this uh, uh, goal in fighting the COVID and pandemic. Now, as, as part of our response to one of the things we are also trying to do is one of the statements uh, Mr. Lumida and I know mentioned in the areas of collaboration. And I will try to just uh, highlight a few things that um, IFMA as an association is currently looking at. Um, one of the key things we are looking at is around capacity building. Um, we are also looking at the need for proper enlightenment and then um, reorientation of stakeholders in those environments and also strategic uh, collaboration. Uh, on our path for capacity building, if I have commenced, I'm almost concluding a total review of our training curriculum to reflect capacity building and empowerment of people in the areas of skills and uh, knowledge that we need to hone our skills in the areas of uh, technology. We have also engaged style collaborators on the delivery channel um, as we speak, we're trying to see how we could effectively and seamlessly migrate some of our physical training to a virtual training. So in this case, we have engaged some credible organizations as our delivery agent, where we'll be able to not only digitalize our training, we also migrate some of the physical trainings in view of the plan to review those curriculum and training models to online real time. Um, part, of our, part of our plan is also to begin to look at the possibility of having a dedicated center where we can make use of as a convenient platform to disseminate complementary trainings and webinars and to also disseminate function specific trainings in line with the current norms and, uh, and uh, uh, realities. As, as, as well. Our collaboration is also going to drive what I call a disruption in the industry. Um, and let me, also, let me also emphasize that apart from the fact that we had challenges to stabilize our reaction, one critical importance that we also need to look at is the fact that we must be able to align our thoughts and our ways to the fact that we have to confront this with the use of technology. And where we don't have a clear path to actualizing this, one of the things IFMA is doing is also to develop how to close the gap in this area 
So in the, in the near future, um, we will also be reaching out to the public in terms of the key critical thinking and strategic directions to be going about in, um, in the areas of uh, technology. Apart from our readiness to also embrace um, and also accommodate initiatives and solutions that will um, complement what we are currently doing. IFMA as an association is also trying to ensure that whether we like it or not, we must continue conversation and engagement with the relevant stakeholders on the need to embrace technology and also go to them with possible solutions as to how to handle one, their respective facilities, irrespective of where they are and where they are located. And again, to also help them harmonize their thinking as quickly as possible to confront these issues. One of the things we're also trying to do is a public engagement and enlightenment. And in a, in a, a, by, the, by the third quarter, starting from July, IFMA will be rolling out strategic information across board to also understand the options available in terms of technology to adopt for respective functions and roles of either a player or a practitioner in the, in the, in the industry. Just before I came into this webinar, I had a meeting with a GM of one of the agencies in Lagos State on behalf of IFMA to have a conversation on possible collaboration on how power and energy to be transmitted to users in a bigger way, also in an affordable manner. So I'm going to say that all the plans IFMA has highlighted from the capacity building to alignment of uh, organizations technology plan with the FM technology plan, we, we are committed to ensuring that what we give out to the public in terms of full optimization of technology to drive business towards success we will we'll be done with a high level of professionalism and um, care. Um, I, I think um, let, let me at this point stop here for further comment. But I, I also need to speak briefly on what our role as IFMA doing to contribute to safety and health and awareness of our members. Of course, like I mentioned, we have continuous engagement with our members using our technology platform, which is the WhatsApp platform, where we'll be continuously emphasizing the importance of compliance with the protocol of, um, of the World Health Organization as we have currently. And um, in this, we would always try to engage in a very technical and um, convenient manner for our members to respect and also follow this protocol. Um, let me stop there for, for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Adebayo. Uh, that was actually giving it out as it were in terms of the activities of Ipman and also what uh, Ipman has put out as part of their core values, which is technology. And also you spoke about the fact that health, safety and environment and wellness of members is quite quite apt. Uh, now, we will still come to question and answer and ask you some of the questions in terms of security and also insurance and the rest. Uh, and we want to thank you very much for that thought uh, presentation. Now, we, we'll go to our next speaker, who is Mr. Uh, Pastor Stephen Jagun. Pastor Stephen Jagun, like has been introduced by Mr. Dr. Mrs. Van, is a, an estate surveyors and valuers and also a practitioner, a member of several bodies in the estate surveyors and valuers uh, 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 global, global uh, village, so to speak. And we believe that he's coming with a very strong weight of experience to talk from both sides in relation to how will facility management companies respond, recover, and thrive. We have used that to, 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 as part of the illustration we wanted him to talk about. You must have responded at the time this came, and you must cover, I mean, currently trying to recover, uh, as it were, some of the lost uh, times, and then going forward, how you intend to thrive post COVID 19, because, like we have seen several times in several fora, this uh, particular pandemic, or we want to call it disease later on, will not leave us in the next one year. 
that's for, that's for sure. It's a flu. It comes. It's here, and people are still dying up to today. But then companies must thrive. So I would like to invite uh, Mr. Uh, Pastor Stephen Jagun to speak to us on this particular respond, recover, and thrive during and after COVID-19 in relation to operators, the market itself, and the members of ITMA. Mr. Jagu, are you with us? Good. Yes, thank you very much. It's a great privilege uh, to be part of the discourse. Uh, I want to thank the organizers once again. I uh, also want to thank uh, the IFMA Council and also those who attend. I have great respect for all of Yes. Uh, this afternoon, it's already afternoon, um, and all those who are listening to us, uh, we hope to add um, value to the knowledge we have. One of the beauty of the thing we are going through now is that um, it has created an opportunity for us to learn, to increase knowledge. I'm very sure most of us, most of the things we have learned in the last few days, uh, if we have lived uh, normal lives that we used to live them, we will not have um, added some of the knowledge we have now. So, including the webinar is uh, a knowledge addition to us. Uh, starting from response, I want to say that um, like um, the MD of uh, the company just said, this thing is going to be with us for some time. And um, the CEO of Microsoft said some few days ago that this pandemic has just uh, fast tracked uh, a two-year digital transformation to only two months. So, and that's where we are, we are today. So, uh, it's a reality. It's uh, the plan that we thought was going to take a long time to achieve. We uh, find ourselves here on every aspect of our lives, not only in facility management. But the issue now is that how do we respond to it? What's our perception? Like the analogy we use sometimes in management, a cup, a, a cup may be half filled. So it's now the, the disposition we have towards that cup. Uh, we're going to say it's half full or half empty. When you say it's half full, what you are saying invariably is that um, there's still opportunity. But when you say it's half empty, you're already losing hope. Meanwhile, both of you have access to the same thing. So what's our perception? What's our, what, 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 what way are we seeing this pandemic? It was not planned for like the previous speakers have said, but it's here with us. How, what do we do with it? In the last uh, few months, particularly the first three, four months of the year, Zoom has overtaken uh, about five major airlines in the world in, in, uh, in, in capital value something that was thought to be for fun, but now it has overtaken them. Talking about the, uh, the airline business, the response of most airlines was to first to start social media about how we expect planes to off. Some of them will have to be starting as they want to push them, uh, we see uh, where, where hangars, where planes are packed all over the place, um, shut down. And the airlines were sucking people in their tens of thousands. And then no one went to start again. But in this same scenario, in the same industry, we have airlines like Emirates doing this shutdown, refitting their own aircraft to take care of the health of the passengers. As we speak now, Emirates have started flying to some destinations. And flying, not only just flying, flying with, I mean, with total confidence of the passengers. What they, are, what they have done is to retrofit their aircraft to include things to ensure, I mean, also present to you that they, they, are, they are ready for what is on ground. What where you are flying before you fly and when you I mean when you land where you're going. So while some airlines were seeing the other side and shutting down and throwing their hands to the wind, 
not knowing what's going to happen next, we have another airline in the same industry, very ready. I mean, this is the challenge. He's here to stay. How do we go about it? And we know that, I mean, Emirates is one of the ways Dubai introduced people to their country so that they can come. They, they thrive on tourism. So while some airlines are shutting down, some respond, I mean, one responded differently. Not only Emirates, back here in Africa, the Ethiopian airline. Ethiopian airline is like uh, the backbone of the Ethiopian uh, economy. What did they do during the pandemic? All their uh, um, customer flights, I mean, aircraft, they were just on to cargo, to do cargo uh, uh, flights, putting goods on the chairs, covering them up so that they can keep flying. Well, we're short, we're, 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 while we shut down all of the, most of the, our own airlines, we're moving cargo from, from one part of the world to the other. And those who want to repatriate their uh, citizens from other countries, they were negotiating on how to help you move them. So our response should be that of uh, this is here. What do we do? How do we take care of it? One of the speakers has spoken about emergency preparedness and business continuity. It's one of the uh, main um, uh, this thing in IFMA uh, um, areas of competence. Yes, this may not have been um, envisaged. I mean, some few years ago when uh, the Katrina, uh, Hurricane Katrina landed in New York, I was going for World War Place, and I know that there were some uh, areas in New York that had no traffic light. People were confused at junctions. Some people could not come down from fourth, fifth floor because they, they are not used to flashlights. Calling fire brigade to come and help them. But I believe by now they will learn better. So how do we now up our game? Because we don't need to only uh, respond. We need to look at how to recover. How do we pick up the pieces from where it is? I listened to, I was part of a webinar some few days ago by Lex Business School. And, um, well, it, uh, the, 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 the webinar was hacked, so they had to be stopped and postponed. By the time uh, we, we reconvened for the webinar, one of the panelists there, I mean, said something that was very profound. She is into the event center. And she has shut down. She doesn't want to lose her staff. Between, she was supposed to speak, and between the time they, they postponed uh, the, the webinar and when we convey, she said she went to her uh, space, go there, and just saw her vehicles lying down, follow. And she just did a brainwave. I can loan these vehicles out. And she went on social media, vehicles out, she want to move things. And before she knew, people were already asking that they were to use those things. So for us to cover now, we need to, now what are the assets that I have? How can I take it off from there? Definitely, in recovery for us in facility management, one of the major issues on the uh, burner, so one of the hottest thing on the burner now is health and safety. Like Mr. Lumide, Engineer Lumide said, we may not be seen as a critical, part, uh, critical partner in this uh, whole thing, but we know we are. Because health and safety, I mean, basically starts with us. I want to talk about safety. We're talking about the safety of the facility users and the assets. When people come, are they secure? Look at the time we shut down. I mean, we are used to maybe changing guards at um, one time or the other. Now we have come to a new reality to realize that sometimes our guard needs to spend, spend more than 24 hours on a location. How do we now ensure that when they stay like that, uh, uh, the, their welfare is taken care of? Do they have areas or places where they can refresh themselves? If there's an emergency, can a guard be on the site for uh, uh, a week on a stretch? Are my service providers ready to take care of that? 
how do we take care and when such things are done how secure are our assets are they going to be paid we have i mean we have talked about the issue of power the issue of um, uh, um technology the issue of internet and during the shutdown one of our colleagues called and said i mean she was used to monitoring the site uh, with cctv but when there was no light after two three hours the cv goes down the batteries are flat because the battery it was used to power so many other things. Now she was afraid of the security of the place, despite security men being on site. So now, how do we now re-engineer ourselves? Do we need, like I told her, the unit now reduced the, the body in the matrix? And what do you need to increase your power? Do you need to now introduce power, solar power? Do you need to look at other sources? So in recovery now, we need to look at the safety of our assets. On the health side, I mean, sanitation uh, of the facility is, uh, is key now. It's very, very key. Some people, if they get to your site and realize that um, uh, uh, from what you have on ground, they are not safe, may not even visit your facility. So there's need now for regular decontamination, for fumigation, um, frequent cleaning of some areas that uh, we have access to all the time. So somebody needs to be monitoring these things. That means the game must be better than what it used to be. Talking about health, uh, the health area of um, facilities, what about the users themselves? There's no need for proper education of the people. As we speak, some people don't believe that this thing is real. They believe that our governments um, just playing with it. Some people are trying to make money out of it. Oh, oh it's a game that is trying to sell. Uh, but whatever it is, what's we need to educate them. I mean, I've met people ask and put it in on their chain. Now you have to ask yourself. Is the face mask meant for the chin or to protect the mouth and the nose? For some people, it's passion. Oh, it must match their dress. Some people don't even want to use it at all. So that means there's need for even enforcement. Oh, no mask, no entry. That means there may be need for even signages to that effect. I mean, before seat belts were made compulsory in this side of the world, we used to visit some corporates, uh, some um, corporations that right from that gate is written there as a private name, no seat belt, no entry. And sometimes you wonder, seat belt, tie the compound, but they are trying to pass a message across until it now becomes, I mean, a norm. Even in, in the, uh, some part of the country, I believe and I heard that some people don't believe in it and there's nothing anybody can do about it. What about uh, enforcing uh, social distancing in our facilities? It is the facility manager that will ensure that this is done as humane as possible. Because if anything breaks down in his facility, he is going to be the one that will be responsible. And at a time like this, it's time for facility managers to ensure that uh, they, they, they not only inform people, they themselves get informed by the day. So plans must be made for the entry. How do you welcome people back? How do you, how do you, do you make people go, go to your users and visitors? to get back to facility. How do you, they are thinking, or they adjust the way they think, uh, they, they do things. Uh, what, what should be their experience? Now, we need to now start screening visitors. How do you screen visitors politely? I mean, there are some people just taking the thermometer on their head, may feel uh, this is getting too much. But it's not only for them, is also meant for to protect your own uh, facility user, other users. 
to that number, there are times I get to the bank and uh, I want to probably make some withdrawal from my own account or make some transactions. And you see some of those uh, account officers trying to make some background check and things. And they will be apologizing and say, no, you don't need to apologize. It's for my own safety. If the wrong person had come to try to also have access to my account, I believe that's the same thing you have done to protect me. So we need to change the mindset of the people. How do we want them back into the facility that we are managing? You know? Number two, uh, what experience should people have? Temperature screening. What do we do? do uh, I mean, uh, there are some people that you may not be, I mean, you need to be careful the way you approach them. When you take the temperature of the others, when the MD is coming or the CEO is coming, I mean, we have had issues in this country of a minister passing through the screening machine at the airport and refused to be screened. Why? Because it's a minister. So, how do you navigate such um, difficulties? What do you do? Do you have um, a thermal or uh, parallel distance to check people? What about uh, food services where there is one? What do you do? I mean, is that, is that an issue? No. no. Airlines, are, they, are, they are thinking about, I don't know why I keep talking about clients. They are thinking about do we need to serve people now on board? Do they need to now pay food? What about lounges? Do they need to cover up? So that people are not going to pick by themselves. You just go and pick what has been served. So if there is food service in, in your facility, what do you do? Ensure that people are safe. What, how do you manage how people used to do things in your system? How do you ensure that your building, your office is safe uh, and also resilient? And when, when the first in this Case, came to Nigeria, people wanted to know where did they visit, where was he, and which estate. People were, I mean, because there will be a stigma to such facilities. Oh, we had that so so, -so place that, that was uh, this thing there. People would avoid the place like a plague. And you don't want such a thing to happen to your facility. So that's where prevention is key. You need to prevent such things from happening to you. What about the, uh, uh, the building technical? Are you ready? Do you need to reevaluate? How do people now come in? From where do they come in? Uh, if they come in, where do they go first? Do they need to have access to everywhere now? Do you need to restrict where people have access to? Now, like Mr. Lumide said, there's need for us not to even, re I mean, to, to sometimes educate our clients. Oh, everybody don't need to come to the office now. Do you now give people a roster? Do people need to come on one um, uh, days or even days? How do they come to the office? When should they come to the office? For example, if you manage a school facility, I'm very sure you have a big challenge in your hands. You used to have classroom that have maybe probably 50 people with a private school. How do you now see these people? Do you now tell them to have a shift like the Jack on Day area when some people have to resume school in the morning, some resume school in the evening? Which parent will allow their child to come in the morning and come in the day? So those are things that you need to start thinking about now. How do you go about these things? Where do you move from where? And then you now need to talk about the awareness of your occupiers. If there's anybody that have any that shows any sign, what do you do? If you have a, a, a rent paying tenant and it's at the lifts and the test the, the, uh, the body temperature is beyond normal, how do you prevent such a person uh, from accessing his office? I mean, legally, he will tell you that he has paid. So, what do you need to put in place? Do you need to now get them along, um, probably have a protocol in place or have a buying of all the tenants that if this happens, we all agree that this is what we are going to do. How do you I mean, react when you have situations so that you don't get out of hand? Because, for example, at the point of entry, somebody may insist, oh, I have been in this office, 
I'm used to see so person I need to deliver so so thing. And then, I mean, your security men or your health and safety guys are having issues with the person. How do you seclude such a person? Manage the situation so that it does not distract others and also create unnecessary sin. Because we know the environment we find ourselves. Some people want to prove their point. Some people will argue with you. And some people will think that they know better. So what do you do? So those are the things that need to be coming across my mind. Like one of the other speakers who have said, how about energy cost? How do we control our energy cost now? Do we need to go more renewable? I believe the earth has rested even the last few months, that uh, few weeks that we have been home because of our uh, carbon emission. How do we maintain that? Now, how do we remotely also manage our premises? Mr. Lumi, they have spoken about that. Likewise, uh, uh, Mr. Shegun Adebayo, how do we now rely on remote sensing, remote monitoring of our assets? Do we need to do everything now physical? Some people still believe that, oh, I'm on, I need to see my staff face to face. How do you convince them? Let's see, for social distancing, we we'll need to ensure that not everybody is in the office at the same time. What about areas like lifts? How do you convince people that, oh, the lift, you only have, uh, oh, it is in the, in the capacity is 12. Why are you insisting that only four people enter? I'm late for where I'm going. Why must I join the queue? And somebody is coming from behind and believe that he must stomp the queue and not be on the line. What do you do to ensure that you manage such things, I mean, without causing a sin? Do you need to fast track some people? Do you need to create a special, I mean, lift for some people that you know that, oh, if this person comes, how do we manage it so that we don't create unnecessary? Oh, the MD of the company has come, a uh, major person has come, uh, what do we do at that point? Do we now excuse others or explain to them? Then what about the Full track management. There are some areas where, I mean, the traffic there is, is something else. If you have such facilities, what do you do? How do you take care of them? And um, another major thing is uh, that of, uh, uh, what do you call it now? Space management. How do we now try to convince uh, uh, occupiers on how to manage their space. One major thing that we know, particularly for commercial spaces in the city cell, is that uh, the cost is high. And the country we find ourselves, naturally, I believe, uh, landlords, will, the last thing they want to think about now is the duration of rent. Some of them are still battling with how to collect what is already due. So don't talk about reduction of rent. So now the tenant wants to maximize space. So how do you balance the two and ensure that um, uh, the, the, it's a win-win situation? How do you collaborate on space management? How do you collaborate on meetings? How do you convince provide alternative means of meeting. Yes, there are some meetings that you must meet, I mean, face to face. I mean, we have had some funny things on the internet of how people will dress with their suits and then you, you realize that uh, uh, they have boxers uh, below. So those, are, so those are some of the things um, uh, for us as facility managers we need to start thinking about as we recover because uh, this has come to stay. Uh, that's a new normal. So it's not the business we used to do. Things have changed. We may know that things have changed. What about our facility users? Our occupiers? What about our neighbors? Because you may be, you, you, you may have taken all the precautions. What about your next door neighbor? So now it's a collaborative thing. We need to carry along even the community where we find ourselves. In your facility, if somebody does not come with a face mask, do you have a thing in place there to ensure that probably you have what to give them? 
knowing the environment we have come we come from if people know that you are giving free face masks all the time would they not be coming every time without the face mask so that they can take a free one from you because everybody wants a branded uh, material how do we do about sanitizer washing our hands at some of those places go to some facilities because it's mandatory what they just do is put it out there there's nobody enforcing it Oh, we have it there. There's water there. There's this thing. But who is enforcing the usage? I would like to stop uh, for now because I think I've taken even more time than other presenters. And um, if there are questions, definitely we'll take them from there. Once again, I want to say we thank you to the organizers and to the council members and the listeners. Thank you. Now, uh, thank you very much, uh, Estate Sovio. They are going for that presentation. To me, uh, you have just given us a guideline. You have just told us what companies need to respond to and also how to recover and to thrive going forward. And we do appreciate the fact that the facility managers have got their jobs cut out for them, no doubt. Because uh, I'll give an example in terms of managing people. Facility managers never see it as you know part of their core values and, and responsibilities. In relation to managing people all right it is it has come you have to manage people uh, my experience in the United States in Houston Texas to be precise when I was running this facility management company a janitorial services company especially for about five six years uh, our own responsibility is to go in there and clean up the place when this when the work is over the staff there we always query us that it is our responsibility to clean they don't have any business with us all right so now it's a new thing and then that means that we you you have to also manage people as it were now in relation to this because you are going to ensure you advise your client on reducing the uh, concentration of personnel uh, reducing physical uh, proximity of staff you know that has come to be part of your responsibility safety and, and security why you also clean and disinfect the environment and all of that and you also need to advise clients on how to keep themselves informed you have now become an advocate as a facility manager all right and because we, you, you used to be seen as people who are just coming around maintain our facilities and do renovation a couple of things here and there but right now you have to have your, your work has been cut out for you no doubt all right so uh we i mean in terms of uh we're going to go to question now and I needed to give that background so that we'll know that definitely it's not going to be the, the usual. You have to maintain human beings. Some of, some of the people who will check the, uh, the temperature at the, at the gates, some of them are from security companies. Yeah. Okay. So what is your responsibility in those kind of areas? Because someone who is a security man just check the, 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 the temperature and the person has come in. All right. Do you have a role to play in all these things? I think we will just... Uh, we will take, uh, let me just say that uh, this particular webinar is made possible by uh, Nata Farm David Consulting, Nigeria Limited, an outsourcing and training company, and also in partnership with, uh, in partnership with Bodea DDG Partnership. Bodea DDG Partnership is an estate surveyors and value and facility management company for over 40 years. So now I think we can go straight now to take questions. Uh, from if you have questions, you can just wave and also let us know that you have questions. If you have more contributions to make, also we are free to do that. Uh, it's very important that we make this a conversation as it as going forward at this point in time, because like I said, there's a lot of work for facility managers to be done. To be done. Okay, thank you so much. Um, it's been um, an eye opener, especially in terms of. Managing people also, not just managing the facilities. It's, um, I was just thinking, wow. So the, the uh, job as facility managers has been expanded to managing people also because you, get, you have to have them informed of um, like the social distancing, the, the, the crowd and all that, you know, the facility and all that. Uh, but I want to ask a question here. Um, I think one of our speakers should be able to answer this question. How will you achieve performance agility in your operations amid this COVID-19? Um, Maybe I'm going to ask um, Mrs. Adam Eloku. How will you achieve performance agility 
during this period? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Definitely, there will be job descriptions for every facility um, service provider for your team members. And um, I think for the period where we're in, we have come to a state where uh, performance measurements will have to be, there will be a way to identify or to measure even by technology. You know, like we already said, uh, most of the things that we'll be doing now will be technology driven. So um, it won't be a, an issue of uh, just being on site to measure. Mm -hmm. There will be a system in place whereby your performance can uh, be measured. I know in the developed countries, um, there, is, there is already a system many years back, whereby even when you're committing to the office, once you log in, the system is there. You know, they notice it. You logged in, you're already doing your eight hours. You don't have to be physically present. So these are some of the things that we may have to uh, implement in our own environment as well. So that, you know, whether you're on site or you're, you're, you're not on site, there is a way that the system records, you know, what you're doing and you are, you are able to measure appropriately. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I don't so know if, if, I can if I can contribute. If I can contribute. Yes, okay, uh, okay, I, I, okay. I just want to give, uh, I just want to give um, a life um, experience I went through some few years ago. Uh, when okay. I was the vice president of uh, uh, IFMA Nigeria, okay, Mr. Debayo is raising his hand. Maybe when I'm through, um, we went to Houston, IFMA Houston, uh, with the then president, Mrs. Marian Johnson, of Nigerian Cleaning Services. And when we got to the Houston office for a meeting, the lady was supposed to meet it. Uh, we met. We were waiting for her. We agreed for time. So from the hotel, we got to the office at Houston. We said, let's go to your office. She says, you does not have an office. I was shocked. I was not wondering, do you work here? But, I mean, but because I've seen her face at uh, conferences, so I know her. She said, yes, because she deals with inner chapters. She does not need an office. That she works from home. So she has a job specification. And all she needs to do is deliver on those job specifications. And every week, she um, submit her report. And that's it. I mean, so, so for some of us uh, around, uh, you know, for example, I, I'm wondering how civil service uh, is going to cope with this because civil service we are used, they are used to eye service. Some offices are all used, also used to eye service. You must see somebody before you know that they are working. So when they, it's only when they see you, you be running around. Oh yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. When you disappear, nothing happens again. So do people now have schedule of what to do? How do you mark them? How to follow up? How do you? I mean, you don't need to see anybody. Just deliver on what has been given to you, and then uh, the, I mean, bottom line is up. Grace, I'm good to go. Thank you. I think we can have uh, Mr. Levi. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I mean, standing on the premise of what I've been said, uh, just a, a, a reference to what I mentioned that uh, if my friend to see how organizations will begin to align their information technology strategy to FM strategy. Because what happens now is that there's a new normal, there's a new way to do things, and there's a new way to also execute. So speaking to the angle of performance uh, agility, it means that um, in the course of alignment, human capital performance is very essential. So when you are trying to narrow down, it means that, um, let me take um, leave for example. Obviously, what one of the things every institution is doing now is that uh, having stayed at home for a month plus, it's assumed that uh, you've taken your leave for the year. So <laughs> when you go back to when the, when there's a new normal facing us, maybe after the ease of the lockdown, we have a maybe eighty percent uh, activities back to life. It means that um, you are not entitled to any other leave. So it means that it will be need for you to begin to do your work and see where there's no leave in sight based on what has happened to us in the past. Then again, that will also lead to a comprehensive review of performance management metrics. Because the moment your JD changes, it means that your means of evaluation will also change. So there will be alignment in the area of uh, staff performance 
and the organization's uh, expectation. And that's also to also emphasize the need for alignment of information technology um, of the organizations against FM, narrowing down to the job functions and job uh, description. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I'd like to ask a question at this time also. Uh, my question will go to uh, Pastor Jagun, and I'm sure other people can also make contributions to this. Uh, I mean, it's a new way of doing things. We all appreciate that. And we're talking about remote working. Remote working will mean that we must have a guideline. There are some work that you cannot do in the presence of your wife or your husband that has to do with your work environment. But while you are at home, there's that possibility you will share this information. It's giving us the guideline as to how to, we should work now. Will it be a responsibility or part of a responsibility or part of the job profile of a facility manager to advise companies on a guideline as to how you work remotely so that you don't get your information flying around? That's just one question I want to ask. Oh, okay, um, if, if I may contribute, um, uh, thank you for that question, sir. You see, the issue is that as facility managers, we are not trying to be uh, the master of all, but definitely, I mean, there, there are needs, um, if it affects you as a company, because it, you cannot be advising your company now on technicalities. Please. If you as a facility management company now you know that I mean, there's some things you need to do. That means like um, Mrs. Alokan has said, there are some things that we need to review. What are top secrets? I mean, for me, during the lockdown, the president wanted to make a speech, and uh, before his speech, the thing was a common knowledge. People were shouting it around. I told somebody I said it's a security breach, it's an embarrassment to us as a nation. But the speech the president wants to give is already public knowledge. I mean, virtually word for word, started working in the in the in the eighties. There is what we call confidentialities, confidentiality of information. I mean, there are some files you go to office, you see top secret, you see secret for your eyes only. You see, there's an office you occupy that uh, some level of um, responsibility goes with it. Which includes that of facility management. I mean, you don't just fly information around. Oh, a social person came to our facility today. What's your business with that? It, that could be a security breach. What some companies have done is to ensure that, that they have laptops for their people so that that laptop is, is programmed for their office. So if you want to do anything that has to do with the office, it has to be there for their own security. So it's not their business. To ensure that that system is secured and is within that uh, this thing. There are some platforms, for example, uh, Microsoft Team and things that you can program to your own company. There's some software you can program to your. Some jobs cannot be done elsewhere; must be done on your system. And the new thing we need to accept now is that um, working from home. So. Now it's now we hold also the star to see how do you create an environment in your place that there will not be distractions. During the lockdown, I called somebody and I was asking him, you saw somebody used to leave home around four, I mean wakes up around four AM, leaves home around five so that I can be in Victoria Island uh, by seven or whatever, so that I will not be late. But he said now he he works more but, I mean, he wakes up at his own convenience at 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock in the morning. But sometimes he can be up working till 11, 12 in the night. More work is coming. Some of us, if we want to be sincere with ourselves, we spend more time now on webinars, on, on the internet, attending this conference, listening to this. There are times we, I mean, some of them will clash and be wondering which one should I attend. So there's need now for us to manage our time properly, manage our own personalities, so in my house, do I tell my family that this is a no-go area? Please, between social time and social time, nobody comes here. Daddy is at work. What do you use to engage them? Do you give them online classes? Do you make the TV available for them? Do you let your wife know that she just assume that I'm in, I'm in the office between the next two, three hours? 
don't be unreasonable about it. I mean, it will, it will not be possible for your children to be seen, I mean, for you to be at home for four hours and say they should not talk to you. I mean, even for your own health, it's good for you to take a break. Okay, uh, I will see you in the next uh, one hour. Please, nobody talks to me in the next one hour. Oh, the next two hours is going to be blocked. Nobody talks to me. After that, we can talk. Uh, I will see you. And they, they can be, you'll be sure that they'll be timing you. So when they time you, give me 10 minutes extra. I mean, now you can mute yourself. You can shut down your video. I mean, just be right about it. See, please, I'm still online. I will be with you in 10, 15 minutes. I believe that if we are able to manage ourselves well, uh, things will go things will go smoothly. It's only for us now to manage the new norm. This is how it needs to go, and this is how we manage it. I hope I'll be able to speak to it. Okay, I think I also raised my hand. Let me yes, sir. add to that. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, please permit me to make a very brief reference to one of uh, IFMA's initiatives during this uh, COVID-19 uh, issue, which is um, the meeting edition of our knowledge sharing session, which was also anchored by uh, Pastor Stephen Jagun. Uh, one of the key things he also mentioned there, which I want to now further buttress, is the fact that uh, at this point in time, there will be a lot of um, continuous engagement, there will be need for people to be responsible and also be accountable. And what I'm saying is that um, from the angle of facility managers, one of this is he suggested at that session was that it's not time for us to engage our line managers regardless of our responsibilities or role, or also to engage maybe our human capital management and design a proper procedure in view of the new normal. And that's being proactive. So when you engage your human capital manager, uh, clearly it will transform into you showing deep understanding proactively of what you need to do. And then no one will negotiate confidentiality. That's a fact. Engagement, again, on the angle of um, impactful uh, activity is to speak to ensuring that the organization also understands the importance and essence of creating an environment that will be conducive and also protect information wherever you are working from. We are expected to be responsible to work from a, 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 a location, your home now, where you can have a dedicated place to do your pseudo or the office activities. But again, it's also important for you to also be responsible on your own part, either by creating a new way of life in your home that uh, it is home and office. And we also have to reflect in that, uh, in that manner. The other one I also want to mention is engaging either the federal or the state government. Um, recently, there was a document that uh, I stumbled on that was, that was developed by Lagos State uh, Safety Commission around the state government uh, plan in, in the area of what we should be doing. And though that document was sector specific. When I saw it, I heard that hospitality was not part of it. So I engaged that corporate, uh, commission to find out why hospitality was not uh, part of it. So I was speaking from an informed position. Now, if you want to bring manufacturing, banking, and a few other sectors out, you also, also consider hospitality business for whatever value it has. So the response was that it's not in the face of, it's not in the immediate phase to open this, those, uh, those area. So engagement and engagement and engagement. I also did also mention that I saw that uh, the government for culture and art and tourism was setting up a committee on how they can bring back that uh, sector back to life. And I was also assisting manager there. So I engaged one of the commissioners that these are the areas we could have done. Why did you find the way to bring us on board and also provide advice? I also highlighted the areas where we can assist. Because you can't speak about tourism without hospitality, no doubt. So it's a continuous engagement at a high level for an impactful uh, purposes. Thank you. I raised my hand. I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, go ahead, please. Okay. I just want to collaborate with um, what the two other speakers have said. I think we're already there because in most of our contracts, we already have non-disclosure agreements. We have confidentiality clauses. So I believe it's a higher um, level of responsibility on both parties to ensure that um, informations are kept and uh, are not um, divulged unnecessarily. 
So in the higher level of responsibility, I believe we're already there. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I think my, in addition to that, my question will go on the issue of safety and insurance. Safety, uh, like I said, I mean, I couldn't have been able to sign any contracts with Prudential Insurance in Houston, Texas, in the United States without an insurance. It is mandatory for me to be able to get into their, you know, premises and every other organizations we were managing to have a, an insurance policy that guides either our employees so that if anything is broken in the office, we are responsible. I don't know, you know, uh, uh, can any of the members of DeepMath speak to this in terms of insurance in, 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 in your workplace? Let me attempt that. Uh, insurance is always uh, an area of interest to me. Um, and I think uh, by virtue of the policies, um, insurance policies, uh, that sector is growing. Uh, the rate of growth, I'm not able to speak to from the, from the practitioner side of it, but I know it's growing. And one of my key responsibilities as the head of the answers of every inquest uh, was also provide a chance um, across um, regulatory requirements and um, in line with the ethical law of, of, of Nigeria. Um, our problem may not be more of insurance, but our problem may be more of the understanding the type of insurance we should do as a nation. As a nation, Nigerians are not uh, insurance savvy, if you ask me. We really don't even believe there's insurance anywhere. Um, of course, uh, NIE and agencies around insurance, they are doing quite a number to educate and enlighten us on the purpose of insurance. But where the regulation requires you to do a chance, you must do. For example, fidelity guarantee in a banking institution is very key. It's very critical. And it's also attached to your um, paid up capital, as, as it were. I can't remember now. There's also um, what I call um, the, the fire special peri and then um, I think householder policy that protects you against fire, uh, burglary. And then last any where they broke into your house without, uh, without they just walk in in that manner. Uh, that's also an insurance that protects you, uh, the owners of the business, against any any peril. There's also the part of the workman compensation that also gives you some level around ensuring that those that work on your site are also insured. Then again, there is also a personal accident insurance and or um, life assurance. So these are insurance policies that is supposed to be taken over by either business owner or a client of yours. Because at that at, at the point in time, when we engage some security companies to work for us, security services, one of the things we asked them was those insurance policies whether they are in place. So they were part of prerequisites we need to have before we engage you in conversation before we also engage you as a, as, a, as, a, as a vendor. So those insurance policies are there. I think compliance and implementation is a challenge here. And that's why a lot of orientation is very essential from the angle of practitioners and players in the, in the, in the industry. Thank you. Um, in addition to that, I just want to say again that a number of, especially the blue chip companies, I've already implemented um, this insurance policies. I'm aware uh, where I worked before. I was also in charge of insurance. There is a workman compensation, and that takes care of visitors in your premises. So while your um, client um, insures you, uh, being a visitor on their premises, you as an FM provider insures your staff also. You know, so these things are already in place. Um, if there is by any way where you're working for an organization as an FM organization and you know that these things are not, is not in place, like we have rightly said, is an issue of discussing and, you know, sitting down, being open minded and bringing these things to the table and ensure that they are properly um, dotted, signed, the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Thank you. Uh, President, let, let's let's uh, 
let me just ask additional question here uh but my, my this question goes to the issue of uh green uh buildings you you do renovation many of the members of ipma some of them are involved in renovation and the new things about green facilities and it's also part of the focus of this year's uh, uh, celebration of ipma globally now what how are we implementing this in relation to the nigerian environment and also to keep our environment green going forward it's all again boils no. down to it's all again boils down to engaging our uh, clients and our customers um most of these things we need to discuss with them we need to sit down and ensure that proper um, like we have said, insurances, proper coverages are given to um, FM providers that are on site. A, a number of us, a number of organizations may not uh, be knowledgeable in this area. It is our responsibility to make sure that training and development is done, both for our, um, our FM providers and then for our um, clients so that they understand why there is a need for health and safety. A lot of um, protections that are expected to put in place. This is a time where we need to sign off and ensure that when uh, FM providers are in your premises, all these tools that need to be uh, put on are actually done. For instance, you have people who are climbing, there are tools that they need to put, you need you see people who are working in construction sites, they need to put on their helmets, they need to put on their boots. Like uh, Pastor Jagun said the other time, you have the blue chip companies, you know, before you enter their uh, premises, all these things, are, they ensure that you wear them. If you need to put on protection on your head, they ensure that you put it. If you need to put on boots, they ensure that you put it. So training and awareness needs to be created. We need to do proper insurance, like we have said, we need to ensure the safety of our people are very key at a time like this and going forward. So it's an issue of bringing up the awareness, training and retraining both our clients and our team. Thank you. If I recommend that uh, Mr. Mr. Lumide is, uh, is hey, green. That is, that is the area, let him talk. Let, <laughs> okay. let Lumide talk. <laughs> I'll mute your speaker. A microphone, yes. Okay. We, uh -huh. yeah, th th thank you very much. You know, Fast Cases Monument has moved from the uh, mundane and regular operational activities. If it doesn't break, you don't fix it. Requests, my AC is not working. We should move from that level now as FMs. Uh, there are a lot of um, publications, a lot of uh, ideas that have stemmed out from IFMA. Uh, research department and it's quite enlightening. FMs now should be talking about uh, research in terms of data. Most of us don't even know the amount of carbon monoxide that we generate in our buildings. We don't have an idea uh, because the generator guys just come, they just size a very big generator because they want to make sales. The generator uh, size, that the size, the large size of the generator is not even required. And it generates a lot of CO and CO2 to the environment. In terms of even greening the environment, we have very few flowers, very few trees that absorbs that CO and CO, that CO2, which they use for photosynthesis, and in turn brings out all sitting that we need to survive. So there is an imbalance in, t in the built environment. And most FMs feel that once I do cleaning, once I do janitorials, once I do pest control, I'm okay. That is the whole essence of FM. Mm -hmm. But in terms of uh, the environment, in terms of managing tax resources, in terms of ensuring that we don't increase the issues of climate change in our environment, it's not really seen as a major practice now. Though I, I know we are still going to get to that level as reality has shown us that we must come with top-notch value-added solutions because clients are tired of listening to the norm of what, what our value proposition 
I will ensure that your generator works well. People are tired about that. We are talking about our environment because the activities in the built in, in our buildings affect the environment negatively. There, there, there was a research by the United States Green Council that over 40 percent of buildings generate uh, um, um, burn fossil fuels and they generate large amount of CO2 into the environment. So while we are trying to uh, clean, while we are trying to generate that waste, where does it go to? Who manages that interface? Do we even have the, uh, the knowledge in terms of the numerical numbers of uh, cages of waste that is generated? Even when we are separating it, plastic waste, uh, liquid waste, uh, electronic waste, paper waste, we don't have that idea. Because if you keep such records, it will help us to very well inform the clients, engage them and educate them. You cannot be managing a place as large as 1,004 and you don't have an idea of the amount of waste to generate. You don't have an idea of the amount of plastic waste to generate. Imagine kind of a plastic waste that will be generated, generating 1,004 every day. And most of it goes to the land, landfills. They are not, you know, taken for recycling. They are not reused and stuff like that. And these are revenue generating areas that is not really being tapped to seriously in this country. So as FM, we consume some resources, we produce waste, and some of these waste are even useful over time. But we don't keep records, we don't know how we can get that back as value to our clients and say that I've generated this amount of waste in your building. Plastic, what of 20 tons, 50 tons. We can use this plastic waste to do one, two, three things. There was a time we were managing one estate and we had a lot of unused tires. We converted those tires to sit out. Just put uh, a cushion in between and form a center table. Kids go there to play, put a uh, carpet grass underneath, and it's like a play center. So the, 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 the tires that we use, rather than using it for something that, you know, burning needs, some people do vigilante, they burn tires overnight, and I don't know the harm they are causing to the environment. So we cannot be managing the environment in isolation. We cannot be managing the building in isolation to our environment. They are interwoven. Now we see, who knows, the cause of this COVID-19. A lot of people, there are school of thought, is China that is trying to attack America. Who knows? Maybe there is even something that is going to come up due to our negligence because we do not have the clear knowledge of what is happening within our built environment. So we are the architect of the problems in the environment, facility managers. And that has to change going forward. And how do we do that? It is by measurement. Without measurement, FM does not make any sense. You don't have no idea. You don't know. You, it's very difficult for you to calculate your labor costs. It's very difficult for you to calculate even Hello? Cost savings because there are no measurements. Mm -hmm. you know, there's a school of thought that says anything that is not measured cannot be managed. So FM needs to progress, needs to step I, up I to that level. And as we now, do that, I'm on an online meeting. I send the number of the person that I'm supposed to talk to. I will send it to you too now. Pastor okay. Jarvis, where you think that was that? I'm on online by 10%. I will send the number to you now. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's very, very essential that. We, we gradually grow to that level. And Minister Adipal said something. He reiterated what we first discussed and he expanded very well about collaboration. IFMA is a fantastic organization that can help. They have blueprints of solutions that can help to assess our building, assess our activities, and come up with solutions that even the clients will marvel. They are saying a case study of 1004 is a huge place, thousands of square meters. And with that, they can even write to the government and say that, see, we generate this amount of waste. Look at what we are doing with our own waste. They are saying, and they can set that as a standard to other big estates. Because FMs, you just go into the estate, we bid for this project, we get it, we procure diesel, we service generator, we clean, we do fumigation causing more harm to people, and we don't measure, we manage swimming pool, we don't even get the, the pH of the swimming pool that we manage, we don't even get the pH of the water that we treat. So without all this info, it will be very difficult for us to even plan for budget, very difficult for us to do our business continuity plan, it's very difficult for us to say we want to add value, it's very difficult for us to say 
the, ne the next quarter, these are the value added projects you are going to integrate into this workplace. So it is essential as FMs to know that there is a relationship between the built environment, green of our environment, and we, the people that use the environment. So greening of our environment is not, it can never be done in isolation to the building itself, because the building is just a box and causes a lot of problems to the environment. So with that one, it will help us know that we need to consider some alternative energy solutions. It's not all the time using generator. We can say, okay, all light systems will, uh, so will, 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 will be used, will be powered by solar panels, we use the PV systems to reduce your energy demand, and a lot of other solutions that will come in because you've done the basis by assessing the amount of energy consumed uh, by, 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 by differentiating it. What amount of energy is consumed by the cooling system in the building? What amount of energy is consumed by the lighting system in the building? And there are a lot of solutions, free solutions online, free software, free apps online can be integrated to help you assess this and give you visibility into what is actually happening in your building and to take informed decision will be very, very easy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very so much. To quickly okay. add two classical examples. Um, these are these are very real life um, issues in the blue chip organization where I worked before. It was a really tall order to convince the management of the importance of having plants in the office. Talking about green, you know, a lot of us we go in AC in our cars. We enter the office, there is AC. We go back in our houses, there is AC. And there is little or no green around us. In our houses, how many of us have plants? How many of, you know, a lot of us see it as waste of money. When, at the time, I was, we were talking about this in the blue chip organization that I work for. They saw it as a waste of money, that you need to, we needed to plant, um, we needed to have plants inside the office. We had to make a case. We had to convince the management that this is a value that is going to be added. The plants breathe out, um, they breathe in carbon dioxide that you produce and they release oxygen. So it was on that biological note that we were able to convince as FM to the organization at the time that we're able to convince the um, leadership, the executive, that it is important. It's not just a waste of money. It's not just occupying space, but there is a biological and health reasons why we must have plants in the office. I think, again, it has to do with bills because uh, you find a lot of us building houses, a lot of landlords in Nigeria, every available space, even houses that they built in the 1950s, any available space, as small as even enough to pack a car, they are building another one bedroom there. And there is no single plant. You will agree with me, a lot of us on this platform have traveled abroad. There is a policy, the government itself plant trees all over. It's your property, it's your land, but you can't even cut the trees that the government has planted. If there is any reason why you need to touch that plant, you need to go and get permission from the local government or something. So I think it also goes back to the government. We need to enforce it that you have the size of property, there must be this number of greens on that property for health reasons. Thank you. So I think okay. it's well explained about it. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, please. Okay. I, um, interestingly, uh, my, 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 my contribution is very simple. I think three, three, three approach. Um, there must be a convergence of thoughts on how to forge ahead because uh, we have to emphasize the importance of green. Secondly, a systemic challenge. And then, um, if you have a systemic challenge, you must have a, a pragmatic approach to dealing with systemic challenge. Um, you all agree with me, during the era of uh, Governor Fashola, a lot of condemnation came that uh, trying, to, it, trying to change our uh, orientation around the importance of green uh, was, met, was met with some resistance, but later there were some successes. Then systemic and ability to continue in that vision became an issue. But let me give a typical example. I'm a banker. I mean, I used to be in the bank. Um, at a point in my career, the regulator of banking, which is Central Bank, came up with a policy called Nigeria Sustainability Banking Principle. It was approved by Committee of Banks executives, and then um, it became a policy. 
they appointed a consultant to deal with the execution of that initiative. I'm not able to say that while it became a key performance issue for me as head of general services. So we begin to develop different types of initiatives to show to the central bank regulator that we are in that line. One of the things we did was that we changed all our, our bulbs to energy saving. Another thing we also did was to try and see how we could manage the, the, the paper we use in our premises. So what I'm saying is that because it's a systemic challenge, a pragmatic approach is required. So engagement and engagement and engagement is very important. In this case, for us, as I said, we should have a convergence of thoughts as to, as to how to deal with this issue because it's very, very critical. Um, if I, at a point in time, I've begun to also campaign uh, the involvement of a facility manager in a project team where they are properly advised on what is appropriate, what is required, and what is sustainable. So I think as a body, a lot of or whatever actions we could take away from here is to see how we can convert their thoughts in propagating the importance of, uh, of, of green. And I think uh, engineer Lumi there can also be a key driver in this case, and if not, we're willing to support the president of this. Uh, sorry, please. Uh, before we round off on that point, um, I'd like to give this other supporting example because I believe we are here to share knowledge and uh, we cannot exhaust um, the number of knowledge that can be shared and be um, uh, an added value to us. You know, a number of our uh, facilities are built in such a way that natural light does not come in. We have seen facilities abroad where, you know, some areas are allowed, you, you allow some of the uh, facility to allow in for natural lights. And it actually does save you money. Um, I think for such facilities, the initial cost may be very huge. But on, a, on the long run, you save on power. So these are the way forward in the industry. We need to convince our clients, our customers, of the need to you know, build facilities that are compliant in this way. We need vitamin D. You know, all this AC all throughout the day, you know, all around the year, it's a no-no. We need to build facilities that will improve our health. So when you have facilities, a few, a few um, uh, um, personal properties, residential properties, have been able to accommodate this, but not much, even in the um, businesses, even in the um, in uh, commercial buildings, they've not been able to accommodate this. I think because of um, the cost. But like I said, initial cost may be huge, but on the long run, you do save because we need our lives to stay on the job. Thank you. We need to go green, and the facility management must uh, managers must play active role in advising. Uh, in an advisory capacity and also propagating green technology and green environment. Uh, I would like to ask my last question of this, if Mrs. Van will permit me. <laughs> my last question will be on collaboration. I'll give it like this. In the construction industry, part of the reasons you have so many, uh, few Nigerians playing in the industry in terms of the construction, not consultancy now, is simply because of the fact that we lack this collaboration. Projects of $10 billion may not be able to be handled by one person, but the person will now is instead Nigeria will look at consortiums from overseas. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen companies in Nigeria collaborate and take projects even in Ghana. Uh, and if FM industry is about $1.15 trillion globally, which means that so many of our Nigerian companies can actually play in South Africa or play in Tanzania. And you may need to start looking at those kind of collaboration because, for for instance, capital is also very important. What level of you know collaboration? I, I'd like to ask all this panel or the panelists. What level of collaboration are you having so that you don't replicate what is already happening in the construction industry and in, in what is happening in FM industry? Because it is actually an issue. You see, uh, the beauty of it is that um, when you talk about FM in Africa. The truth is that Nigeria is taking uh, a leading role. Nigeria is taking a leading role in that assignment. And people are doing very well in that, I can assure you. Um, we have um, homegrown FM companies in Nigeria. 
and are doing very well. Uh, by the grace of God, some of us have been able to deliver lectures outside the country. Some, some of us, some, there are some people who are doing consultancy. I mean, um, uh, Ulumide I know has some footprints in, the, in uh, Southern Africa. Um, is it Kenya, Malawi now? We have um, MK Balogun that is in almost six or eight countries. We have some of our colleagues. Uh, we have um, uh, some of our people who are into training, Rubami, who, I mean, we, 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 we are like family. That, that's, the, that's the beauty of what we still have here. Well, it, because FM is actually, like you said, is, is, is too large. I, uh, that's one of the things that actually also has um, been foiling my interest. I, I've, I've found in America sometimes, and one of the beauty of um, FM is that it also allows you to network. I've sat with people who have asked, what do they do for a living? And they say they cut trees. And I'm wondering, cut trees, company. And then they show me the number of states they are in America. I've been wondering. I want to show things. I've given the example before. I see God wants me to know. I, I, I was coming back to England. And the street where I lived, I just told my host that um, something has changed. He said, you have started. You're always noticing something. In your... I said, no. I said, it's not the way we left this place that it's. As, as, as we took some meters off where we're standing, I saw a gang of four that were trimming the trees on the streets. I mean, uh, the, the one was driving. Two were cutting where to cut. The third one was behind the little small truck. I was shredding what they are cutting and bagging immediately. Like only when they said, going green. A gang of four. And imagine now, that's narrow in Nigeria. If you want to cut a tree, you have to call an illiterate to cut the tree. Uh, probably break your window pane, break your glass, break your, the windscreen of your car. And uh, all he owes you is uh, sorry. And if you don't pay his money, he has a <laughs> And uh, after paying him, you go and then you take care of your problems. But see, and the same way, if you look at some of those who have been cutting trees, who have been cutting over time, they know where to cut and what to cut. If you go into plumbing, there are some people I've met who are not into general plumbing, they are just into drain cleaning. If you have a block drain in your facility, call them, you know what to do, they know what chemical to add. In Nigeria, you have a block drain, you call a carpenter, I mean, you call a plumber, he first break everywhere, and then now notice that the problem is somewhere else, he has to have broken so many things, but see, when people specialize, so is it, that's the beauty of FM. See, we can be doing so many things. Specialize in your own area, and it's just, as you specialize, others can add value to what you are doing. And that's the definition of FM in the first place. Where we have so many professionals who are collaborating to make the workplace I mean, a beautiful experience. So I, I believe that if we, although we have some little challenges, I must be frank with you, in this side of the world, because the economy is very bad, everybody wants to do everything. So if you call somebody, he claims he knows about everything. Even in cleaning, I mean, there are people whose job are to research. They want to research what better chemical can they use? Uh, what better ways can they make this work? Like in this COVID now, you have seen how people, Olumide has alluded to that, have been very innovative about um, probably um, touchless uh, uh, sanitizers, hand washing machines, some of them very small, some of them very, I mean, some of them not expensive. I mean, to create solution to the problem that is on ground. And that's what we need to do. If, if we look beyond our present state and we continue the way we are, I believe that uh, we, we will do much more together because the market is extremely wide that no one person, no one company can uh, occupy this space. Is it into research? Is it into consultancy? I mean, I've met people whose job is just to uh, tell you about space management. Before now, before we go to where we are now, event management, if you want to have a party in your house, you go to your neighbors and borrow table, borrow plate, borrow chairs. When more people come, you go, hey, go to the third house. You have not borrowed anything there. But now with event management and planning, we have realized that we, you can outsource that. 
just walk into your own event as if you are a visitor, enjoy the atmosphere, the ambience, and the service, and walk away, not thinking about uh, who provided what. In those days when you're having a birthday party, 11 o'clock, you have not slept because you are still cleaning your compound. You are still begging your neighbors. You are still returning chairs. You are still returning plates. And then they are complaining that, oh, we gave you six. We can't find uh, two of the spoon. Okay, okay, I'll look for it. I didn't know this is what's your own. But now with the event, and the same thing with facility management, is so wide that we can actually outsource so many things to people. Stay on your lane. When you stay on your lane, you can be a common expert there. People you know that that's where your, your own area of expertise, and then we can collaborate and make a better place for yourself. That's just a little contribution I want to put you. Okay. Quickly, let me add that um, collaboration is the way forward. The beauty about uh, facility management is that facility management accommodates people from different disciplines, different backgrounds. You have estates of your. I even had my micro. I even had my um, um, my BSc in microbiology. And interestingly, I found that even as a microbiologist, I have a place in FM because you talk about hygiene, you talk about safety in the workplace, you talk about janitorial services, you talk about microorganisms. So I, I'm, I fitted in very well as an FM, even with my background in microbiology. Now, on a larger scale, you have the Institute of Estate, uh, Sovio, you have uh, all other stakeholders, um, uh, um, engineers, architects, all these are there, rather than fighting one another and um, making one another look less superior, less important. There is a need for us to collaborate because you find every, every, every one of this profession involved in setting up a facility. Before the FM person eventually comes to manage it, the architect designs, there is the work of an engineer. So we need to collaborate. We need to be on the same page. We need to work together. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I would like to hand over to Dr. Mrs. Surivan so that she can take her final words from our panelists and then we can round up this session in just a minute. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been an interactive session today. And uh, I'm sure that all participants will not regret being part of this. Um, we've learned a lot from the president himself, the vice president, uh, Pastor Jagu, and uh, Mr. Ulumi, Engineer Ulumi Daino. Um, well, thank you so much. And I just want um, each of the speakers to just give a, a parting word in, 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 a, in two seconds for the listeners to go with. If okay, we go I, by... I, if, if, you, are, you are raising up your hands. So yes. your hand, okay. yeah. If we go by the way we started, let me first of all give my concluding remark. And like they say, ladies first. Um, okay. what <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, what I would just encourage is that um, there are opportunities in the ongoing. Uh, let us open our eyes. Let us put our eyes on the ground. There are great and huge opportunities. While some uh, doors are closing, other doors are opening. For instance, um, there may be reduction in the use of space, but we mm -hmm. find that, that other opportunities are opening. Um, there is huge, um, huge opportunity in technology. So I, I think the best thing in, at a time like this is just for us to be innovative, to be creative, leave our eyes open, our ears open, take opportunities when we go to our client sites. And honestly, life goes on. Thank you for having me here. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Abibola Adameleko. Um, we need to be innovative at a time like this. Uh, we need to also think out of the box. So it's a good thing uh, that the COVID-19 came around. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't have uh, had some of these opportunities we have and then change our own orientation and thinking about on how we do our jobs or carry out our activities or, and so on and so forth. I want to just say again that Mrs. Abimbola is um, the president of IFMA. She's the president of IFMA. She... Um, 
She's a faculty facility management professional from Houston, Texas, International Facilities Management Association. She's also a certified security professional. In fact, I'm amazed that she moved from microbiology to facilities management, and she's actually worked with um, um, notable organizations like the Pricewaterhouse, and then she's gotten herself to this level. Thank you so much, and we have the privilege of having you, madam, and um, taking you out of your sleep, because I know you're not in Nigeria, and we just had to pull you out, and then you insisted that you come around to give us your wealth of experience and to also help us over here to know how to move on and strive amid the COVID-19. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. You're welcome. Akibola, Adamele. You're God welcome. You. I'm glad to be here. It's, Thank you so much. Good. So, Mr. Debayo, Mr. Debayo is the Vice President of IFMA. I'm sure you are still here. Yes. Mr. Debayo, are you still have around? I'm very much around. Okay, so can you give us a parting word? Okay, I think my parting word will be in two forms and very briefly. Uh, okay. Shalini collaboration, Shalini collaboration, like I've emphasized, for us in IFMA, we are enablers. And then um, we're not only open to ensure that um, we disrupt the built environment with sustainability and operational excellence, but also willing and ready to collaborate for a forward-thinking country, a forward-thinking association, and a forward-thinking global world. Thank you. Thank you so much, forward-thinking association, forward-thinking persons, forward-thinking nation. And then we need to collaborate. Very important, very key. Collaboration is key if we have to move forward. I want to say again that Mr. Debayo is a fellow of the Institute of Administrative Manager, UK, and um, is a member also of uh, Society for Corporate Governance of Nigeria. He's a chartered member from Chartered Institute of Purchasing and Supply Management. He's also a facility management professional, uh, International Facility Management Association, Houston. He's an executive council member of International Facility Management Association of Nigeria since 2015. And um, he's also a, a, a pioneer publicity secretary and vice president. He's so committed to continuous professional and personal development. Mr. Adebay, I want to thank you especially because you were so accommodating when um, I sent you a message for this um, webinar. And then um, I must appreciate the fact that you readily accepted to speak to us. Thank you for all that you have said on this platform. God bless you. Mrs. Abimbal, are you raising your hand again? No, please, no. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. So, um, Pastor Jagu, please, can we hear, get a parting word from you? Oh, it's a privilege to be part of the panel. Uh, I want to thank you for putting this together. Um, well, one of the phrases, some of the phrases in the topic I treated has to do with tribing during and after COVID. Uh, and like I said, my opening word, it has to do with our perception. We need to be positive thinking. The truth is that facility managers are in the center of this all because either residential, commercial, industrial, uh, whatever sector you want to talk about, facility managers are involved, we are key, and we are one of the main sectors that will make this thing to run. So we don't uh, need to embrace whatever has happened and they just deliver solution. One key thing that I want to have behind our mind is that uh, we should not think about the immediate reward. That's where some people get the mistake. I mean, thinking about immediate reward. No. Uh, try as much as possible to deliver value. When you deliver value, it will be appreciated. And then you, 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 you sort of uh, get goodwill. People know that you are in a time of adversity, you are there. So when things work well, they can't forget you. So it is not that because there's an adversity now, I mean, as a practitioner, you should look for how to now, how can I make money out of this? People are going through their pains. Both your occupier, your, your users, your visitors, all the traffic to your, to, to your site, they are going through their own problems now. 
So as much as possible, let them see you as a partner in progress and deliver results. So when you deliver, naturally, um, rewards come with it. It's a pleasure of being with you. Thank you once again, Mr. S uh, Pastor Stephen Jagun. Thank you so much. Um, you said something here that we should not just expect the reward now. We should add value first. The reward will naturally come. I love that. Thank you so much. And I just want to say once again that um, Pastor Jagun is a fellow of Nigerian Institute of Excess Surveyors and Valuers. He's also a fellow of Royal Institute of Management. He's a certified facility manager of International FM Association. Is a former honorable secretary of uh, past and cha past chairman of the Lagos branch of Nigeria Institute of Estate Surveyors and Valuers. Thank you so much, Pastor Jago, for your time and for the insightful um, uh, presentation you gave to us. I'm sure we are going home with something. And, and me, I'm going home with adding value and then expecting the reward, which comes naturally. Thank you so much. Um, engineer, I know. Are you there? Please, can, you, can you unmute it? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Your parting word for us. Okay. Um, thank you for having me here again. It's always a pleasure, you know, when you are doing a webinar with some of your mentors and your professional colleagues. <laughs> I, I really appreciate uh, everybody's an opportunity. Uh, these are the people that... Uh, we are carrying cane to flog us to go and study more. And I thank God they are seeing the reward of their training to some of us. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's really an opportunity. I see us in Nigeria now and in Africa especially that uh, it's a great opportunity for us to scale above. The Americans, Europeans, and the developed world, they've actually given up on us thinking that nothing good can come from Africa. But... I'm here to announce to them that these are time. They couldn't find the alleged solution to the COVID-19. came from Madagascar, and they are trying to play it down. That is not going to work. But time is going to tell that Africa is now. This is the best time to go back to the drawing board. This is the best time to go back and identify solutions, identify problems, and come up with solutions collaboratively. I don't see why other FM companies cannot collaborate, cannot merge together to be stronger. Because you see, even have other international FM companies managing our most prized asset, which is uh, ASUROC. It's still being managed by international organizations. When we have first-class FM companies in Nigeria that can even do better. So it means we have opportunities. We need to research more and find out new ways of doing things. There are a lot of opportunities right there in solving so many problems. We can fabricate, we can test, we can design equipment ma machines in this country rather than going abroad. Now, if you ask, if you ask ourselves during these two months plus of pandemic, we have been managing what we have locally. We have been managing it locally. Though it may not be sufficient to drive of our business to level at which we want. But assuming this pandemic goes forward to the next one or two years, obviously it's going to be with us for a very long time, the way HIV has been with us since the 1986. So, but because of research, some um, suppression of the virus within the system, boosting of the immune system has helped us to outlive it. But we still have people that live with HIV to date. So it is now that we can work, we have to, we cannot do we cannot do um, uh, um, haphazardly trying to get the solution, not following the process. China started in the 1970s, and look at where they are now. So if we can go back as FMs, we are not. We should not be seen as people that just consume things, buy diesel, consume, buy uh, plumbing materials, consume, buy uh, paper, consume. We can create solutions ourselves. We can create ideas. We can create technology solutions in this country that can solve our innumerable problems. And I, I, I advise every organization to have a research and development department. Without research and development, I don't think 
we'll be able to drive anything positive. I don't think we'll be able to really add any value to the people that we serve. Because it's from that department that solutions will spring forth. Solutions will spring forth. Taking problems to that department, solutions will spring forth. And by the time you pilot it, you propose it to the client, the client appreciates it, and you become a champion. The client will love you for life because you already solved a problem for them. So, and I also want to encourage younger guys in the FM industry, this is a profession of choice. Sometimes when I look back, I ask myself, how did I find myself in this profession? Because this profession sometimes does not allow you to sleep. You're always on top of your toes, you are thinking, you are trying to ensure that the requests are being you know, attended to on time, your supply chain is at inter because it's one that will feed other input to your to your internal processes, you know, a whole lot of things. But it's interesting because you learn a lot, you become jack of all trades, you improve, it will challenge you to want to learn, challenge you to want to study, and at, at the end of the day, you'll be resourceful. And in turn, it will translate to ROI for you. So it's it's good. FM has taken me to places that I can never imagine that will be FM has really put food on my table that give me the opportunity to meet people like Pastor Jagun, to meet uh, the doctor in front of us from Odea DTG and also the um, consulting firm that have organized this uh, program and also uh, Amibu if my president and uh, VP Mr. Debayo for this opportunity. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Ms. Can uh, I quickly you. make a request before okay, we round please. up? Okay, I know that this meeting is being recorded. Please, can you send it to Ifma? Oh, sure, sure. We, we Thank we'll you do that. so much. Thank you. Okay, right. Thank you so much, um, Engineer Aino. Um, Engineer Aino is actually the founder of FM Talk 360. I'm sure a lot of us um, in this industry know that. Is the also the vice chairperson of Institute of Workplace Management UK, Nigerian region. Um, Mr. Engineer has won so many awards, including Winner of African Prize for Leadership Excellence Award 2018, Facilities Management Personality Leadership Prize Award, and so many and so many of them that I will not just continue to mention. Thank you so much for everyone who attended. I want to especially thank for the Ade Deji Partnership, who supported and sponsored this program today. Um, I'm, I'm sure we are going to have more of this because we have come to this level where, or this um, state where everything is now online. We are doing a lot of things online. I, I heard two people saying, even the cleaning is going to be online too because we are all going virtual. Um, I also want to thank um, the CEO of Nata Pan Baby Consulting, uh, Mr. Kenneth Odishola Stevenson, for moderating this program. And I don't know if he has a parting word for us so that we just call it um, a day. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, my, my parting word will just be to thank all the panelists. Uh, it's been an awesome uh, afternoon. Uh, Actually, when facility management first surfaced in Nigeria several years ago, I mean, via Akintunde uh, of Afamed, it was, uh, what do you may call it, uh, quite a number of people didn't understand it. But it has, become, it has grown to become an industry of choice where professionals are turning out so many expertise. And uh, we are very proud to actually be able to host this webinar. And hopefully, there will be many more of, of such that is coming. As consulting and outsourcing firm, we go around the industries in Nigeria, and uh, very s the, tomorrow we also have a webinar on the construction industry. Thank you very much again. So thank you, everyone. God bless you. And uh, we pray that the COVID-19 will um, ease off sometime, but while it's still, it's still around, we'll be able to survive and strive. Thank you so much. God bless you. To the particip thank you. participants, I also say, say thank you to you all. So bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.